get ready to worship the Lord, to praise Him for who He is, for all that He's doing in our lives. We're going to praise Him, praise His name. Come on. That's what we're here to do this morning, amen, to praise His name, to bless His name. You know, most of us come to receive from the Lord, but why don't we give back to the Lord today and just say, God, we're going to bless Your name. Let's sing this. Blessed are those who run to Him, who place their hope and confidence in Jesus. He won't forsake them. Blessed are those who seek His face, who bend their knee and fix their gaze on Jesus. They won't be shaken, so come on and praise the Lord with me. Sing if you love His name. Come on and lift your voice. Come on and lift. all of our praise. This is why we praise you, Lord. And blessed are those who walk 
with him Whose hearts to sit on pilgrimage with Jesus They'll see his glory And bless are those to die to live Whose joy it is to give it all for Jesus And for him only Oh Jesus All for your glory Oh come on and pray that he's doing, all that he's done in our lives and here in, our, in the midst of our church, amen? Aren't you excited for what the Lord is doing in our church? I know I am, and so today we have those that have come to be baptized in the waters. I think they're from our Spanish ministry, so why don't we just remain standing with them as they come to be baptized? Good morning, church. My name is Ivan Garcia. I am the pastor to Bear Creek in Espanol, and this is my sister, Blanca Fonseca. Esta es mi hermana, Blanca Fonseca. Blanca, tú confiesas que tú crees en Jesucristo como el Salvador y el Señor de tu vida? Confieso que sí creo. <risa> Amén. Pues es mi privilegio, mi hermana, basado en tu profesión de fe, bautizarte esta mañana en el nombre del Padre y del Hijo y del Espíritu Santo. Amén. Amén. Man, it's just exciting just to continue to be in these waters every single week as lives are being changed. I hope that you're just catching that 
just being a part of that. That's just a great, great experience. So today we got three more that are coming to profess their faith in Christ. This is Liliana Nava. Tell everybody, what is your testimony of faith, Liliana? Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Amen. Awesome. Based upon your public profession of faith, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We're buried alongside Christ. We're raised to walk in a brand new life. This is Sandra. Sandra Salo, tell everybody what is your testimony of faith. Amen. Based upon your public profession of faith, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We're buried alongside Christ, and raised to walk in a brand new life. Finally, Mr. Mitchell Dunlap. Mitchell. Tell everybody what's your testimony of faith. That Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Amen. It's awesome. Based upon your public profession of faith. I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We're buried alongside Christ, We're raised to walk in a brand new life. That never gets old. Do you know, since January, we've seen over 50 people baptized in just this year. That is so exciting to see how God is working. Um, and I'll tell you, each and every one of the individuals that we've seen to date, those are people who have accepted Christ. They have been promised a home in heaven. They're experiencing the joy of knowing the Lord and the peace that comes from being forgiven of your sins. And that is just such a blessing as we get to celebrate with, uh, celebrate, uh, with them uh, their testimony of faith. So um, anyway, wonderful, wonderful. Next week, I think we even have more people scheduled to be baptized. So you're going to want to come back and see that. Hey, if we haven't had a chance to meet, my name is Tim. I get to serve as the executive pastor here, and it is such a blessing to gather together with you. And if you're our guest, thank you for being with us today. We would love to connect with you. As you entered the worship center, you should have received a bulletin. There's a welcome card in there. If you didn't, there's one right in the chair back in front of you. It is a great way for you just to let us know you're here. If you take that card, you can drop it in the offering basket or go to the information desk. We've got a great gift for you that we'd love to just say thanks for being with us. I'll tell you, that, community, that welcome card also is an important way for everyone here that if there is a need in your life that we can pray for, if there is a decision that you're looking to make in your next step of faith and in your journey of following Christ, maybe it's to be baptized just like these folks and you've been watching these week after week, maybe you've never done that and you'd like to speak with one of our pastors, we would love to visit with you and help you in your journey of following Christ. The other thing you can do is if there is a prayer need, you can take that card, let us know. We'll be faithful to pray for you this week or at the end of the service, go by one of our prayer stations at the back of the room. We'll have folks there that are ready to pray with you before you leave church today. Hey, we're gonna get ready to take up our offering here in a minute, but as our ushers come, I wanna say thank you for how faithfully you brought food in to give to Katie Christian Ministries. Uh, we surpassed what we gave last year and this year giving almost 6,000 pounds of food that's three tons of food. And I'll tell you, Katie Christian Ministries is a great ministry in our area. They serve over a million meals a year uh, to help feed people in our community. They also, while they're doing that, share the gospel with folks and let people know about Jesus. And that's why we partner with them. And as you give, I'll tell you, we also send them money every single month. We give them over $10,000 a year because they do work beyond feeding people. So outside of the food we've given, we also support them with some financial help with all that they do. And so we are thankful for them. Thank you for your generosity. And as we get ready to give, I hope that as you give, you know you're making a difference. God, today, we want to give out of joy. We want to give out of faithfulness to you. We want you to know that we worship you and that you're first in our life. And so as we give, God, take what we give, use it to keep sharing the gospel in our community and in our church to help us grow in our faith. God, we thank you for the opportunity, just as stewards, as we give back to you to be a part of what you're doing. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, ushers, if you go ahead and start doing that. And while they do, I just want to talk to you for a few moments about first things first. You know, we're right in the middle of this emphasis, this spiritual journey together called First Things First. And here's what that is. Together, we are seeking, every one of us, to make Christ first in our hearts 
personally. It is a personal spiritual journey that we are evaluating and growing closer to him. The second thing is that we would make Christ first in the agenda of our church, that we would get better at that. And here's what we're, here's what we're striving to, uh, to do there. That agenda is the gospel. It is us sharing Christ with as many people as possible in our community and around the world. And we've got three priorities that are a part of this first things first um, emphasis, this journey that we're on together, that we've starting now, but it'll be for the next several years. If you haven't had a chance, we've got this journey guidebook that we want everyone to have. And if you don't have it, stop by our information desk or the first things first table out there. We'll give, we'll, we'll give you one. There's devotionals in here. There's places to take notes from Pastor David's messages. But as we're seeking the Lord and growing closer to him, there are three priorities that we have. One is that we would increase our giving through our ministry. Now, here's what that is. Through our ministry is everything that we experience every single Sunday. It is our preschool ministry, our children's ministry, our student ministry, our adult discipleship ministry. It's our sports and rec ministry. It's all the things that we do on a week-to-week -week basis to grow as disciples, but also to serve our community and grow in our faith. Now, here's the great thing. Over the last eight, nine years, our giving has consistently remained at about 3.7 million. Some years it goes down to about 3.5. Some years it's gone up to about 3.9. This year, we're projecting 3.7. That's what we've been consistently. Now, here's the bad news. For eight or nine years, our giving has consistently been at $3.7 million. And we experience inflation just like you do as a church. And so we are doing more and more as we grow with fewer and fewer resources because the fixed expenses, just like your fixed expenses, they do go up a little bit. But I can tell you, we have excellent leaders and they continue to do a great job of leading those ministries. But we believe we can double our impact as we are growing as a church by increasing what we give through our ministry from that 7.4 million over two years to 9.3 million over two years. So over the next two years, we wanna grow that and double our impact. I'll tell you what else that allows us to do. For those of you who've been around a while, we as a church about eight years ago, we had a debt of, a, of $8 million, just over $8 million. Today, that debt sits at $2.8 million. Isn't that exciting? We are getting closer to experiencing freedom from that debt. And that is a major part of giving through our ministry, is that we're going to accelerate that even more than we already have been doing over the last eight years, to where by the end of 2027, we believe we could be free from that debt. And that is our goal. Because when we are free from that debt, it frees up all those resources that we can do even more ministry than we're currently doing. We can start new ministries and expand what we're doing and keep sharing the gospel and giving it away. Well, the second priority here is in our community. And what that means is for a million dollars, we could expand our court venue. Now, our court venue serves two of our four worship services on Sunday mornings. The chapel service that meets at 8.30 in the morning, and then our Spanish ministry service that's meeting right now. Now, in the court, we set up 350 chairs. And our Spanish ministry every Sunday is bringing in extra chairs because they're seating around 320, 340, and sometimes 350 or more people in there. And we just keep piling chairs in. Isn't that exciting? We are growing and reaching our community. But for a million dollars, we could do a small expansion on that court venue, and it would increase the seating capacity. You can see a picture there. It increase from 350 seats to 650 to 700 seats. You know, that court venue is also used for a lot of other things. And so that the million dollars impacts a lot of different ministries. The, the final area that we believe that we can um, impact our world more through our giving to First Things First is for the world, through our missions. We want to give a million dollars away over the next two years. Every year we have groups that are going to Guatemala. We have groups going to the Dominican Republic. As we partner with our ministry partners, we can expand into El Salvador. We want to do work down along the border in South Texas as we partner with a church there and help them share the gospel with people in that region. We want to help people in our very own city through Mission Centers of Houston and giving more to them because there are so many needs right here. And so for 
the money that we give, we want over the next two years to give away a million dollars to help in sharing the gospel in our city and around the world through our missions. Together, we can do that. Let me give you a quick, um, a quick guide on how to start praying and decide what part do you want to have in this? I know my wife and her are doing this. We have these little commitment cards, but it's really more like a, a worksheet and a guide of how to consider what you give. The, first, the top of the card above the fold is pretty explanatory. It's just trying to identify where am I in my giving journey? I would encourage you to read through that and decide here's where I'm at and what would it look like to take the next step. But below the fold, it's, God, what do you want me to give? Sit down with it. Start praying. And here's just one scenario of what that might look like. Every one of us who give, we all started at zero. Maybe that's where you're at today because this is new to you. But all of us start in this journey. And so maybe you're there where in line number one, you might say, you know what, I'm not giving anything right now, so that would be zero. And then you go to line two and say, you know, I want to get started. I want to start giving to what God is doing. I want to be faithful as a steward and honor him with my finances. And so maybe you say, you know, I'm going to start at $25 a week. Well, $25 a week is $1,300 a year. So you might enter in $1,300 in that line too. And you total those up from starting at zero and then $1,300. So you're going to give $1,300 a year. That's what you're striving to do. Now, again, this is just between you and the Lord. But as you give that, for two years, you'd multiply that, and that would be $2,600 over the next two years. Now, there's another line there that maybe you've got some stored resources. Here's what that might mean. Maybe you've got a motorcycle sitting in your garage that you never ride around on anymore. And you could sell it, and you could give what you sell it for to the ministry and the work of what God wants to do through first things first. So that stored resource would be a one-time gift, and maybe, you know, it's older, you get 500 bucks for that thing. So you'd put 500 there, and so over two years, you would be striving to honor God and, and say, you know, my goal, as God has led me, is $3,100. There's lots of different scenarios in this guidebook that you can look at, but in the end, it's really you sitting down, praying, evaluating, and saying, God, where do you want me to move in this? And then as you do that, you reach a point where you say, God, for the next two years, you're first in my life. You're first in my finances. And I'm going to give back to you. We just want to encourage you as you are growing in your journey of faith. This is one of the areas that has impacted me the most, I'll tell you that, in my journey. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for the opportunity to be a part of what you're doing. God, I know in my own heart, giving and being a faithful steward has helped me to overcome greed and recognizing the difference between what is temporary in this world and what is eternal in heaven. That I have the opportunity to store up treasures in heaven, as your word says. God, it's helped me to recognize that everything I have is from you and I am dependent upon you rather than lean on to my own independence. And God, as a steward, striving to be a good manager, that God, as I am able to, that I can give more and more away, knowing that I see the benefits from it and that I know one day in heaven that, God, there is a reward waiting for me. God, giving is such a transformational thing in my life, and that's what I want it to be for everyone else. It's a lot less about finances, and it's a lot more about my relationship with you. I pray that for everyone that as they strive to make you first in everything in their life, that God, we as a church would also, as we put you first, be able to impact this world, impact our community, and God, as a church, grow stronger and deeper and more faithful to you, that this would be a place that people would be turning to for hope and help and encouragement, and that we could share Jesus with the thousands and thousands of people that you are bringing here to our community and our city each and every year. That is our desire, God. So we're trusting you to meet our needs and to bless us in the process. We are looking to you. We are putting you first. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm Richard Burton. I've been here eight years. I'm Brandy Burton, and I have been here probably over 17 years. 
I actually started at this church when it was on Clay Road. We had some friends that went and um, we would go with them. And then we moved over to this location. And so I just brought the family over and we all started. Um, all my kids grew up here in preschool and we just started attending regularly. I was married, I had the family, and the marriage I was in was not what I thought should have been. And so there were things that I did that destroyed that marriage. And I'm not happy about it, but those are the choices that I made. And throughout that whole time, I knew that there had to be more than just the guilt or the shame or the hurt and I still came to church. I knew that there was still hope. I went through a divorce, but I wanted to keep my kids in church. So that was important to me that we just stayed in church um, at least on Sundays. And then I met Richard and funny story is that he, wanted, he did not want to come to this church, so we explored others. I was open. I was like, whatever is comfortable for you, well, let's go. And um, by that time, I kept getting more and more involved um, in, in serving more and doing more in the church. And um, he saw me doing that, so he started. When we were dating, I seen her going to church every Sunday and I was laying in bed and I didn't want to go to church, you know, and um, I kept watching her go and eventually I came and she, we went to, we visited a lot of different churches and we ended up here. Um, after hearing Pastor David speak, I broke down crying, sitting right over there um, and joined the church right after that. I came from a dark part of the world. Um, I came from a place that was really broken. I was spiritually bankrupt. I'd done some things that I'm ashamed of, and I was trapped. I couldn't get out. Um, I tried to commit suicide, um, and I, I was still alive. You know, um, God, He never gave up on me. You know, there, I'm here for a reason. I didn't know that reason. Um, and all the shame and guilt had me trapped. It had me, it was destroying me. Um, I had a lot of unanswered questions that I needed to answer. It took me to actually allow him to come into my heart. As he says, you know, behold, I said, door and knock, I will come into you. Well, I had to allow him to come into me. And it wasn't until I met my wife and coming to Bear Creek where I finally let my guards down and allowed him to come into me and start to change me. This church is is my second family. Uh, my grow group, uh, Faith and Life, is my family. Um, I know I can call them gentlemen anytime for anything, and they'll be there. Uh, we lost our granddaughter, three months old. Our Faith and Life family, they were there. The church was there. Um, we just lost her ex-husband. Once again, the church family was there. Looking at my life, before I started this, I, I, I seek God more. He's first in our lives. Everything we do is for Him now. When I finally believe that God forgave me, and when I realized that and I truly put that in my heart, and it, he, the shackles fell off, um, it's hard to even put in words the freedom, how free I am now. But it allowed me to even go deeper with Him because I seen his promises start to be fulfilled in my life. Yeah. And once I seen that, I wanted more of them. I want him so much in my life that nothing else matters. I had to, in order for that freedom to happen also, I had to let go of some things for him to actually come into my heart. And once I did that, that freedom even grew even more because now I wasn't tied down to the, like, Pastor David says, you can tell you're what you idle by your checkbook. Well, when you actually look at it and you really pay attention to it, there was a lot of things that I was idling that wasn't of him. And I couldn't give back to the church because I was, I was buying other things. And I was treating him like secondhand. Like here, I'll just give you this. I'll the give leftovers. you the leftovers. And 
I give my wife the credit. She was like, we're gonna tithe, we're gonna tithe. When we realize that God is our king, he's our number one in our life, then everything else doesn't, nothing else matters. Everything falls to the floor because now you are only serving one person and you're not serving everything else that everybody else wants you to serve. You're serving the king and that's it. We put God first in our lives when we woke up and did studies together, when we started reading the Bible together, when we incorporated praying at night before we go to bed, our life changed. He changed my life. I know He can do the same for anyone. First thing first, it's not just in church, right? Yeah. It's outside of church, it's your life, it's what you do on a daily basis. You don't go to church on Sunday and then forget about it Monday through Friday, you know? And when I think of first things first, I'm saying, you know what, God, all of this is yours. When you're living your life for Him first, life seems easier. Like you have hope, you have a reason to smile. You have, a, if you do it on a daily basis, you have a reason to say, you know what, God, I made it through today and I pray that I keep you first in my life throughout the day. And I try to do that on a daily basis just to remember that like, Lord, you are King of Kings. You are King of this household, not just on Sundays, but throughout the whole. Every day, yeah. If you give it to God, like he says, you have to surrender it and you have to say, I am tired. I don't want to do this anymore. How can I live differently? My soul.
We want more than just a Sunday morning faith. We want more than just going through the motions on Sunday morning, God. We want you to be a part of every second, of every minute, of every hour, of every day of our lives. We want you to be first, that no one would take your place, God, that you would be just what we wake up singing in the morning, thankful. What we would just lay our, our, our head rest down and be thankful, God. We want you to be first, in everything of our lives. We truly love you. We worship you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You can be seated and welcome. And that's so much of what First Things First is about, is to move beyond a Sunday morning faith. Hey, I want to welcome you too. If you're new to Bear Creek, thank you so much for being a part of this service and in this movement that God is doing in the life of our fellowship. So this message is a part of the First Things First movement. By the way, if you brought uh, your guidebook with you, it's page 27 if you want to take some notes. That would be great. And so uh, there's the identifier for it. This message is the third in this series, and it's about digging out what is the core of your life. This message is about discovering what you want most, most, what you strive for most, what's first in your life. It's about actually discovering that. So the faith story that you just saw of Richard and Brandy, I mean, they're they're examples of what happens when you just stop and ask your heart, I mean, are the things that I'm striving for, uh, the things that are first in my life, are they worth it? I mean, do they make me flourish? Or are they like slowly destroying me in some way? And I think their lives, their, their, their lives are an example of the incredible difference that making Christ first in, your, in you can make. And so that's the movement that we're in right now uh, as a church, just a, a five-week period of time where we're asking, we're, just, we're trying to be honest, and we're asking about each one of our lives, is Christ first in me? And then the second is, a, is for our whole congregation, for our church at large, and that is, is his agenda first in the life of our church? Uh, but the most important The most important of these is the first, is Christ first in me? And so, how do I even begin to evaluate that? Because I know me. I know that I have blind spots. I can ask a question in my own heart, but I know that I'm blind in some ways. If you're blind in some ways, you don't even see. You don't know that that you're blind there. I also know that, you know, I don't always tell myself the truth. I tell myself what I want to know. And so, how do I know I'm even telling myself the truth? And so, how, how can I even begin to evaluate whether Christ is first in my life or it's something else? I think I can tell you how. I mean, here it is. Let Christ himself use the diagnostic tool that he gives us in the Sermon on the Mount to do that in your own life. And so he offers it to us in Matthew 6. It's going to start in verse 19, but don't even go there yet because, man, get the context of this. I mean, think about what the Sermon on the Mount is, and think about the spot where we're going to drop in on the Sermon on the Mount. Look, here is Jesus. He is fully God. He comes to us in flesh. 
in order to do something. And one of the things he came to do is to fully communicate the kind of life that we could have that flourishes, that has joy and fullness and real meaning. It's why he came to show us this life and to give this life to us. And so he preaches and proclaims it for three or three and a half years all around him. Honestly, this message that he preaches uh, of the gospel, um, it starts in Mark 1, Mark 1, 14, Jesus came preaching the gospel, saying, repent and believe in the gospel. The message of Jesus was the gospel. And the gospel is the identifier of this life. The life that he describes in all of his teaching. It identifies the power and the, and the supernatural changes that come into our life when we embrace Christ and when we embrace this life. But it also identifies the message of this life. The gospel is the power, the change that comes into us, but it's also a label. It's an identifier of the message of this life. Uh, and the Sermon on the Mount is the compilation of everything that Jesus taught in those three years as the gospel. It's Jesus' 2,000 word summary of this life. And we're going to go to the very core of it, the center point of that message, the pinnacle point of everything that he calls us to do and be. And it's there we find the diagnostic tool to ask, what's first in my life? And here it is. It's Matthew 6, begins in verse 19. And Jesus says at the pinnacle of this message, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Right? You've been in church for a while. You've, you've heard that verse, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Right? Have you heard it where a pastor or a preacher or a teacher says, so your treasure follows your heart. And then you go to another one and you hear them and they say, your heart follows your treasure. And so which one is right? They may both be right because what it means is they occupy the same space. Your treasure and your heart occupy the same space. And so verses 22 through 24 continues this description. Then the culminating verse, all the way down to verse 33, Jesus culminates it all by saying, but you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness And all these things, all these things that you're anxious over, all this stuff that you strive over, all this stuff that you pursue, all these things that you need will be added to you. And so this is the Word of God. It speaks with a supernatural power. And look at the bottom line. Look at what Jesus is saying to you and me uh, at the bottom line. He's telling us that if you want the life that the gospel promises, then it'll come to you as you learn something. And that is as you learn to seek him first. That's the whole reason for the movement. It's the whole reason for the series. It's what's in this passage. How do I know? How do I know what's first in my, how do I even evaluate that? Jesus is going to show you it's when you evaluate it on the basis of learning to seek him first. And so, how do I know it? Uh, He's first or not? I I can give you the same diagnostic that Jesus is using to figure it out. Let's go to the diagnostic. Three questions that help you diagnose who or what is first in your life. If you want to discover if Christ is first, you got to be willing to sit for the three-question diagnostic. Are you ready? Question number one. Is Christ first? Question number one, what does your heart treasure? And you could add the word most to the end of that. What does your heart treasure? What does it treasure most? That's what Jesus is describing in 
Verse 19 and 20 and 21, I mean, right? That word just keeps rising to the top. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth. Verse 20, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Verse 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so you can't serve two masters, he's saying. You, one of these is going to be the treasure uh, of the treasure of your heart. And so what Jesus is saying here, it's got multiple layers. I mean, he is God in flesh, and so when he speaks simply, I mean, we can see something on the surface, but it has almost endless layers below it. And somewhere underneath, somewhere under the surface, Jesus is showing you something important. Listen closely to this, and that is that your heart treasures some things as ultimate things. That your heart treasures some things as ultimate things. And that's going to... That's going to help you with the first diagnostic question. It could be, Jesus is lifting it up here as, a, as an example, it could be money itself. But more likely, more likely, money's going to point out what your heart treasures. I mean, you're, the, the deepest treasure of your heart might be money. But it's more likely that money is going to expose what your heart treasures most. He's giving us a diagnostic question. Don't invest in earthly treasure. He's at least saying that your money flows into what you treasure. And so I said it might be money itself, but it might also be that money will expose it because your money will serve. Your money will serve what your heart treasures. So here's the question. What do you use your money to get for you? Yeah, get past utilities and groceries and gas, okay? Get past that. Um, What do you use your money to get you in the deepest part of who you are? It'll show you. Some people use money to gain significance. They use it as their significance. I mean, it's it's the way they come to feel worthy or valuable themselves, and then it comes, it comes to be the way they compare themselves to others. And so, and so it, it will move, it will just, it will so imperceptibly move to, well, I may be better off than you to I am better than you. Some people use money to feel important or to get approval or to gain control, they use it, they use money as their significance. And so it may be that that's your deepest treasure. Or or others use money to feel safe. They use it to feel safe. It's one of the reasons some people find it difficult to be really generous in giving, especially in their giving to the things of God, because it threatens, they think it threatens their safety. Why? Because they have decided that money is their safety. As long as I've got X amount of savings account, or I've built up these, you know, these investment tools or whatever, well, then, then I'm safe in some way. And so they find it very, when it becomes the source of your safety, it becomes very difficult to, to release it. And here's the question, why does it have that power over you? Why, why does it have that power over you? Now, it, it, it could be because you have made it your ultimate security. And, and honestly, hey, I love you and I hope you love me, but I'm going to say it's a foolish choice. Because money has never stopped a human being from dying. Their body decaying and dying. Money, money cannot stop a relationship from crumbling. Money can't stop tragedies, uh, uh, you know, unknown tragedies, uh, unpredicted tragedies from happening. Money can't even stop a little bitty tiny single cell in your body from mutating uh, and and moving to your pancreas or your lung or, uh, or your kidneys and starting to replicate until it takes your life. Money can't even stop that. I mean, how is it your safety? How is it your safety? Some people... Some people use their money to make their here and now life the most pleasurable that it can possibly be. And why do they do that? It's because it's serving. It's serving as their substitute. It's serving as their fill-in for joy or peace or meaning. 
And Jesus is at least saying money can't purchase what is ultimate in you, in you. Money cannot purchase what is ultimate by pouring it into what is earthly. Houses, cars, credit card balances, vacation, vacations, $1,000 um, uh, concert tickets. Some of you know exactly what I was describing there. Good, good. No one's money has ever been the answer for deep joy uh, or peace. It's never been. In fact, I talk about it all the time. Typically, after someone acquires lots and lots uh, of it, actually it comes to terrify them because what they assumed would be their ultimate happiness, the big pile of money, um, doesn't at all do it. And so they, they now have no other answers. They don't have any other answers. It terrifies them. And so all they have left is to use the money to distract themselves from that fact. There's a contemporary theologian who says, you are what you love. And you love what you worship. He's talking about what you treasure most. That's your God. It's ultimately your object of worship. And for some reason, Jesus points at our relationship to money as the diagnostic question. Here is a way, he's saying, that you can diagnose what is first in your life. And one of the only ways to break the power of money, uh, is uh, to, the power of money in you, is to learn to generously give give it, especially to the purpose, purposes of God. That's what Jesus is saying here to do, store it up in heaven. And, and, and the kingdom of heaven, he means toward the gospel for the purposes of, uh, of God. It's a, it's a part of what Jesus is saying next, store it up in heaven. I mean, this is why a core discipleship principle is in first things first. It's for all of us to commit our giving to the things of God. I mean, our giving is as important to our spiritual growth and development as feeding on the Word of God. Our giving is as important to our spiritual development as learning, uh, as learning to pray every day and develop a relationship with God. Our giving is as important as worship, as opening our heart to the Lord uh, every single day and adoring Him. Our giving is as important as spiritual community connecting to one another in the body of Christ in order to gain strength. It is, it is that fundamental to our spiritual growth. That's why First Things First has such a discipleship aspect to it. And, and that's what's important about what we will do in two weeks on March 3rd. When, when we take commitment cards and and what we're going to do is express, express a discipleship step in each one of our lives where we say, I'm going to, I'm going to begin to become a consistent giver to the Lord out of my discipleship to him. Or to move to an intentional giver where I'm making it, where I'm making it important in my life and I'm, and I'm asking the question whether this is more important than my giving, what I spend my money on or to a priority giver where it becomes first in my life, or to a lifetime giver where I'm saying, I want the most significant investment that I make in my life to be to the things of God. And so that's what actually makes what we will do in a couple of weeks really sacred because it is a huge and important step of discipleship in us. And so Jesus is saying, look, the only treasure that will, give you, that will give you life and joy and real peace is heavenly treasure, and that treasure is to have Christ at the center of your life, as the source of your life, and, and you should invest. Jesus is saying you should invest deeply into that. That's why Jesus says in John, 30, John 7, 37, if anyone is thirsty... Let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, relies on me, puts his faith in me, as the scripture says, from their innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Jesus is saying, 
only, only me at the center of your life is the only thing that will quench the thirsts of your life. There's a second diagnostic question. I want you to see it. The second one is this. So it's not just what do you treasure most, but secondly, who reigns over you? Who reigns over you? That's what's happening in that culminating verse, verse 33. But seek first, he says. But seek first. And then he uses a first of two words. Seek first his kingdom. But seek first. It's a strenuous word. It means, uh, it means to be constantly seeking. Uh, it's an action. It's something you do. It becomes the continual pursuit of your life. But seek first. First there means priority, passion, focus. But seek first what? His kingdom. Now you need to understand what kingdom is. Uh, to seek first his kingdom is to seek the authority of a king. To, to seek first his kingdom is to offer your allegiance to a king. And, and the same is true for a Christ follower. If you reside, you reside in the kingdom of this world, but it doesn't make you a subject of this realm. It all depends on which, where you have pledged your allegiance. And for a Christ follower, it, it is you reign over me. There are a lot of social science studies that say every person lives for someone. Actually, every person is, is ruled over by someone. And that someone may be a parent who has died 20 years ago, but they still rule over them. Their opinion uh, about them, what they said about still rings in their ears. Or it might be a boss, or it might be a friend, or it might be a spouse that, that you know, that they, they rule over you. What they think of you uh, defines your identity. And, and the word of God here is saying, no. If Christ is first in your life, it means, it means that the reign and the rule of Christ uh, is first in you. You seek his rulership in your life. Uh, and that's why it's so hard to be a Christ follower in this culture. Because this is about coming under his rule and reign. Therefore, it means you live by the commands and the promises and the principles that Christ gives you for what is valuable and important and worthy, except those are always, and they have always been, in competition, in contrast with, with the values of the world. I mean, it's not new today that, that basic Christianity is in absolute contrast with, with the values of the world. Let me tell you about the values of the world. They change every 15 minutes. Now, I'm not kidding you. Listen, you really need to think about this, especially if you're a young adult. You're, you're bombarded with the world telling you what is important and valuable and worthy. I'm telling you, by the time you get to your 30s, everything that you learned in your 20s is going to be upside down. Nobody's talking about those things anymore. I, I can give you an illustration. I mean, it, you know, it exposes how old I am is what it does, but I can give you an illustration. I was thinking about this. I was thinking about it as a child. From when I was a little kid, I, I was trying to think, um, what were the values that were communicated to me most importantly? What do I remember being the most important values? You're never going to guess what number one was for me as a child. It was patriotism. I mean, that's what was at the top of values in the culture when I was a little child. You know what the second was? The second one that I remember is this. A man's word is his bond. It means you got to tell the truth. And you got to do what you say you're going to do. But you know what? 15 minutes later, it changed. And then in the 70s, it changed. In the 80s, it changed. In the 90s, it changed. Now, every 15 minutes, it changes. Look, this stuff that you get really passionate about that you see, right, you know, on, uh, um, you know, on TikTok and all, I promise you, this passionate stuff is going to change in five years. Why not move to a set of principles that will make your life flourish? Why not move to a set of principles that are eternal? Why not move to a set of principles that will give you ultimate joy and peace? And that is the principles of the, of the rulership of Jesus in your life. And I promise you, if you dig into them, you're going to find plenty that offends you. Because, right, if he's God and you're not, 
Some of the stuff he says that's important, you're not going, you know, if you were God, you wouldn't do it that way. Now, what's the question? Who rules? Who rules? If you want to answer the diagnostic question about who is first in your life, what is, who is it that rules over your life? Our time has really flown. It's really flown. I'm not accusing you of listening too slowly. It's just the time has really, really flown. Let me see if I can mention the last one and get, in, and get into what is the, the, the most important. The last one is this. What's your core principle? What's your core principle? Um, what do you treasure most? Who rules over you? What's your core principle? Or Jesus, he said, look, look, here, this should be your core principle, his righteousness. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And so righteousness, again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shave off so much here. So I'm going to leave some stuff out. So if you're thinking, man, I think he's leaving some stuff out. Yeah, he's leaving some stuff out. And, and here it is. Uh, his, to seek his righteousness first, it's a relationship word. And it means, look, it means at the top of my principles is I, I want righteousness. Well, what is it? Righteousness is a relationship word. And it means, it means a right relationship with God. In the Old Testament, that was about obeying 600 and 13 commandments. In the New Testament, it is about putting your faith in Christ and he makes you, he declares you right with God. And then out of that miracle, there comes this motivation and this desire and this thirst to live pleasing to him. Is your first principle enjoy the journey? It's an okay principle, but it ought not be first. Is your first principle, man, I got to control my circumstances around me so, you know, things don't, you know, blow up? I mean, it's an okay principle, but they're going to blow up. What if your first principle was eternal? And your first principle is I want to pursue a life. I want to pursue a life that just pleases the one who loves me most. Look, if Jesus, if Jesus is the answer to all three, what do you treasure most? Christ is first in my life. Who rules over you? Christ is first in my life. What is your core principle? To please him with everything in me. There is an outcome, and there is an outcome that is so incredible. I mean, it's hard to grasp. And that is Matthew 6, 33, the outcome of that verse. And all these things will be added to you. All the stuff you churn over, significance and safety, and joy and peace, all of that stuff that you churn over and every need that you have, Christ meets. He promises it. You'll have everything you need. Now listen, the greater miracle and you will be satisfied by them. I'm going to ask us to bow together. what's going to happen for just a moment or two. Eber's going to come and join me and um, he's going to sing over you the more than a Sunday faith for just a moment. But I'm asking you, would you be honest with your own heart? Break through some hardnesses. Ask yourself honestly, what do I treasure most? Ask yourself honestly, who rules over me? Ask yourself honestly, what's my core principle? Would you take a moment in prayer and turn all of those to Jesus as your answer? Everett's going to sing over you, then I'm going to come and close our service.
my everyday offering. Hell's not scared of a Sunday faith if it only leads to empty praise. What really makes darkness run is when the saints arise and praise in quiet on Monday. That's what we want to feel in this moment. All I'm compelled to bring is my everyday offering, and that's me, my life, given to you because I treasure you most. Living under your rule and reign because I honor you, I worship you as the core of my life. And you, you are my core principle to live for you a life that pleases you. Father, every single one of us in this room is praying, would you move me beyond a Sunday faith to live every day for you. We pray that now in Jesus' name.